So first I'm going to talk about Act 21, the most recent uh, federal transportation funding bill and its relationship to sustainability and how um, social sustainability can draw from that to creating livability. Then I'm going to define livability in terms of equity, quality of life, and accessibility. Um, then we'll, I'll kind of describe how performance management can be used as a tool to achieve social sustainability. And then I'll uh, give you the results of my um, best practices agency scan and an assessment of the Atlanta region's current practices, followed by recommendations. Uh, so MAP 21, like I said, is the most recent um, funding bill for federal transportation. It had a lot of notable qualities of it that were different from past bills, um, first of which is nine uh, national performance goals that the transportation, transportation agencies have to report on. And they're listed here. Um, these goals have to be reflected in the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, and the one that I really want to call out your attention to is environmental sustainability. Um, you're probably asking why I'm talking about that, because we're just talking about social sustainability, but I would like to argue that um, the human environment can be part of that, due to quality of life. I'll kind of describe how these connections are in just a minute. Um, another uh, notable point of MAC 21 is uh, the TOD pilot program. Uh, where uh, transit agencies have to prove um, progress towards these three uh, bullet points here in order to get uh, discretionary funds. And the second and third of those are both related to social sustainability. Um, so there's been some other uh, support for, federal support for uh, social sustainability in particular. And I'm going to kind of from here on out call it livability, just in the transportation and land development context. It, uh, so the FDA has a website on livable and sustainable communities that has lots of different resources for transit agencies to, um, to look at and different case studies. There's also a partnership formed between the USDOT, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the uh, federal EPA to promote uh, sustainable communities and livability and increase transit options um, and improve affordability for those transportation options. Um, and then all, all of these agencies listed on the third point, fourth point have also provided guidance on how to link transportation and livability. So before I go any further, I'm going to define what livability really actually means. Um, so we have accessibility up here, which is probably a common term familiar to most uh, transportation officials, but it's usually pretty narrowly defined, um, essentially just asking, okay, I have this location, you know, uh, community or commercial development, whatever, is there a road that goes there, is there a bus route, whatever that goes there, connects it to something else. Um, but accessibility is really a lot more than that. It, the different aspects I have on here uh, with these arrows. Um, so quality, access to quality opportunities, you know, that means like access to medical care or um, healthy foods, things like that. Um, safety of all various modes, walking, biking, everything. Um, actual physical proximity, um, you know, as there are sidewalks all over the community, but they just don't really lead to any other destinations. Um, uh, affordability, um, so how affordable is the transportation? Can I access and use it, you know, based on the price that uh, it costs? Universal design refers to the design of the actual facility um, in such a way that anybody, uh, people of all abilities can use it. And uh, quality, multimodal choice. So all of these together um, can be put into a balance that together kind of uh, form equity, different levels of equity. And, with, and when you balance all of these together, um, that level of equity dictates the quality of life, which is basically the crux of the Um So what is transit, transit role in mobility? Basically, is just by its inherent uh, existence, can reduce uh, per capita BMT and mm -hmm. uh, uh, greenhouse emissions. And it can also improve safety for different access, uh, active modes, biking, walking, things like that. Um, it can help with placemaking of communities and economic development. And it also um, uh, gives transportation independence for our seniors and uh, disabled. So the relationship of performance management to mobility what I'm going to talk about next. Performance management and strategic performance planning is um, something 
that's been really taking shape in uh, state UTs and MPOs and the vet and transit agencies over the last decade or so. Um, and for lots of different purposes, um, they've been using this to, to take actual performance outcomes and use it in transportation decision making. So just summed up really quickly here, what it what it entails is establishing goals from the entire agency, goals and objectives, and then creating performance measures that are based on those goals and objectives, tracking the tracking the performance, and using that performance information to make decisions um, and evaluate progress to those goals. Um, so this is done, like I said, for a lot of a lot of different um, types of performance measures, but not quite as not quite so much in livability. Um, they're starting to do some environmental uh, sustainability measures, which we'll see in a minute. Some examples of that. Um, livability is still kind of kind of rare, and one of the reasons for that is probably the lack of data, um, and also issues with attributing um, performance outcomes to certain performance metrics. So quality of life indicators, <coughs> attributing the the values of those to actual um, yeah to actual transportation infrastructure. Um, so I'd like, yeah, I'd like to argue that I guess trying, starting to measure some of these things, at least tracking them, and maybe not connecting them to decision making just yet, will help to expand the evidence base and help us understand what these connections might be. Um, so I did just kind of a quick uh, scan of different agencies' websites online, try to figure out what the best practices were, um, who the, the leaders were. I just picked out a few here. Um, Sound Transit in in the Seattle area has a whole sustainability plan. They have lots of tracking measures that I thought were pretty interesting. I'm not showing you a couple examples here. Um, the Senate household budget spent on transportation, back to the affordability access thing I was talking about before. Um, and that annual savings from uh, public transit use, again, kind of affordability measure. Um, they ho they're hoping to expand it to future measures. Um, like I said, they're only doing tracking now. They're not really incorporating into decision making. They're just trying to get a feel for what the system is doing. Another example is the SEPTA system in Philly. Um, they have a whole sustainability framework. Um, a part of that is the social sustainability initiatives. Um, they have a few different goals here. Uh, one UTOD per year, trying to have farmers markets on their uh, on their property at transit stations and things like that. Um, and they also have a really strong commitment to the senior citizen population. Uh, another example is San Francisco BART. They have lots of different tracking measures for quality of life. Um, you can see some examples here. They have, they've also created a composite index for station environment that kind of combines maintenance issues and uh, landscaping materials, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, the one that I can find that was really starting to use some of these metrics is it's not a transit agency, but they, they deal with all the transit of Sandag and San Diego, it's an MPO there. Um, they combine their land use and transit planning together um, to encourage density and affordable housing and transit access. Um, and they also, um, you can see the example of their geographic analysis here, they try to uh, determine the distribution of benefits for different transit scenarios. Um, so the just kind of summary of everything that I found, um, a lot of, not a lot of agencies, but a handful are doing tracking measures, not really, like I said, not really attributing the outcomes to any specific uh, project or decisions. Um, and this probably has to do with attribution issues. Um, some uh, livability measures do have targets. But those tend to be more operations based, kind of like the BART example I gave about, you know, companies at the station, that kind of thing. Um, and largely, environmental sustainability is much more widely considered. Um, but a lot of agencies do have just broad livability goals and objectives, maybe a couple measures that um, so now we're just going to look at the Atlanta region and what they're currently doing. Um, so the AFC's Plan 2040 has a very strong sustainability focus. Um, they evaluate projects based on a whole host of um, sustainability factors that are uh, related to social sustainability. Um, they also uh, have interagency cooperation and performance reporting for their local centers uh, initiative, which uh, looks at a lot of different factors of social sustainability. And the city of Atlanta, on their website, they're developing a sustainability scorecard. I couldn't really find any other information about that, but hopefully it'll come out soon. Um, and uh, the and our website had a little bit of uh, sustainability uh, metrics on it, but mostly uh, on 
required on a sustainable way. So my recommendations would be to consider, uh, continue to consider land use and transit planning concurrently and to broaden the scope of accessibility metrics to include things like access to healthy food and medical care, um, ADA compliance, transportation, affordability. Um, some of this can be achieved through interagency partnerships like with the CDC or with other smaller transit agencies throughout the region. Um, and use this information to benchmark with other regions so we can start setting uh, definite targets and gauge our progress towards social sustainability. Um, but also, the use of uh, composite indices is helpful because these um, weight at different attributes uh, based on their relative importance, um, like the bar example. Um, and you can use um, qualitative data from a survey, categorical. Um, to help weigh these indices and to know what is important for the ridership, uh, for the riders. Um, this is just an example of interesting data sources that aren't your typical, like, data or NTD or whatever uh, data, database. So, in conclusion, MAP21 creates a unique opportunity for transit agencies and other transportation officials to be leaders in sustainability, and they can do that uh, in one way by broadening their scope uh, accessibility and social sustainability to include lots of different types of measures um, and through interagency partnerships and just beginning to track measures <coughs> that eventually will inform uh, performance based decision making. And that I was just thinking about um, some of these different measures or potential measures. I mean, the barber's market really stood out to me. But, <laughs> yeah, um, it was. And I was thinking about how it would be interesting to overlay um, some of these different tools in the first presentation. Uh, as a, as a, and also thinking about the connections of crowdsourcing and social media for people to, and it connects back to the second presentation with perception and yeah. how people feel about their, their transit stations. But, um, how that can all feed into that conversation with <coughs> the transit agencies as they're looking to change the perception of a station or a system as they're looking at a, a more holistic approach that improves sustainability and livability. Um, and also um, understanding where to make their investments to, to, to improve the different things. Yeah, I think, it's very that, interesting. I think that in the future, when uh, more of us, you know, Basically, it's widespread that people have smartphones and things, and we can do these crowdsourcing types of things. You know, we're at a transit station, we see something, we put it into our phone. That can be part of the whole database of information that we can use to, to make performance based decisions. So, yeah. um, I noticed you put on your one of the data sources the housing and transportation affordability index, and I'm familiar with it, the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And I'm really impressed by it because it's kind of a way that that could be have some sort of practical application. Because when I look at it online, I'm thinking the catch is that it's not really digestible to the public. I think I think it's more of like a planning tool versus a assisting the public with making better decisions kind of tool. Like yes, we know that um, that, that that affordability is not there, but then what? You know? And did you think of like practical ways that maybe um, local government could apply that? Um, as far as the public using it, not really, but... Or the public or the government, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be sort of best to be using a geographic analysis so you can kind of see how the different neighborhoods um, have uh, affordability, access to transit, um, you know, how that relates to their actual physical access to transit. Um, as far as communicating that to the public, uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe, I'm not sure if the index would be better or just a place percentage of income would be in a better way for them to understand that. I think we're going to turn it over to Hokey. Okay.